and, allow me, and allow me to linger. Uh, I see somebody's hand up. I don't know if that's an old hand or a new That's for the hand. prayer line. That's for the prayer line. That's for the prayer line. Okay. So we're just going to continue there. All right. So let's let's pick up. First, I'll ask if there are any questions. You can raise your digital hand. And outside of that, I'll jump into what I think would be the questions I would ask if I were you. All right. If you have a question, raise your digital hand. I'm checking the chat. I see Natasha, IP. Uh, Natasha, you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hi, um, I'm Natasha's husband. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Thank, thanks for letting us know. <laughs> um, I was wondering, so in this day and age, going to a church on Sunday, what would that be considered? Um, if, if you took your church going on Sunday and, and Elijah was here, or Elisha, or Ezekiel, or Isaiah, or Jeremiah, any one of them would say that you were doing Baal worship. Understood. In fact, if you go to Isaiah chapter 66, verses 17, God is still hasn't changed his posture on the meat, nor on the, the worship day. On Isaiah 66, 17, he says, if he comes and finds you eating pork, you will be destroyed. Right? That's some strong language. And in Isaiah 66, uh, I'm trying to think of what this other text is. Let's pull it up real quick. I, I like I like Q&A because I don't feel as rushed. Uh, I felt a little rushed earlier, only because I knew that you, know, you guys were very patient and were on for some time. Let's look at Isaiah really quick, and let's see if these things really matter. You know, we serve a God who one of his taglines is that he doesn't change. Right? That's like his claim to fame. It says, behold, I change not. All right, so let's let's come on. I'm in Isaiah 66. I'm going down to verse 17. And then we're going to go to verse 23 and talk about his Sabbath and see if that changes. He says, they that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination. That's me eating swine or, or mice, right? And it says, and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. He considers those things the same. Eating a pig is the same as eating a mouse or a rat. The, the Canaanites and the Philistines specifically worshiped the mouse. So when they um, had gotten the, the um, Ark of the Covenant and you know they took it from the Israelites, God sent them tumors on their behinds, right? Because they were sodomites. Makes it really hard for you to, to commit sodomy when you got a tumor in your tail end. And then he plagued them with mice. And so to appease God, and he, he gave them, he plagued them with mice because that was the God that they worshiped. Just like in Egypt, when he plagues them with, with lice and he plagues them with, um, with storm and with famine, each one of those, those attacks by God wasn't just against the people, it was a spiritual attack against the God that they serve. Believe it or not, um, <laughs> Brother Natasha's husband, we still worship mice. You know, if you watch the football games, what's the first thing that they tell you when they win the game? They go on where? To Disneyland or Mouse Land, right? Or, or Mouse, is Mouse Land. And what's the other one? One is in Disney's, is Mouse Land. And the other one in California is Mouse something, whatever. Anyway, we still worship in Mouse Land in Cali, Mouse World in Florida. Mouse World. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So this was um, uh, Isaiah 66. I like also reading from the ERB. It says, the Lord says, these are people who wash themselves and make themselves pure so they can go into their special gardens to worship their idols. They follow each other into the gardens to eat meat from pigs, from rats, and other dirty things, but they will all be destroyed together. I think one of the other things was, uh, I think it was bats that people also ate. You find some of that reference in the Bible as well. Let's go down to verse uh, 23. Remember I told you about he hadn't changed on the meat, nor has he changed on his Sabbath day. And it says right here, it says, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, right? He doesn't switch from one Sunday to another. This is Jeremiah talking about when Christ returns. It's not changing. So if you're on the line and you still keep in Sunday, research this Bible, just read it, man. You ain't got to research, just read it. And you, your eyes will open up if you, if you want your eyes to be opened up and you ask the God, God to open your eyes up, he will open your eyes up, okay? 
And so from one Sabbath to another, so Sabbath doesn't change. I heard a song by the Winans when I was a kid, and it was talking about how we were going to be walking around heaven on Sundays and do this and do that, and it was going to be a holy day in heaven. No sir, Bob. It was, it was the same way here when Christ was here, Luke 4, 16. It says he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath as it was his custom. Um, Paul did the same in Acts 17, 2. He went to the synagogue every Sabbath as it was his custom, all right? So everyone will come to worship me um, every worship day. They will come every Sabbath and find in every first day of the month, this is what, what I, the Lord, have, have said. Why do they come in on the first of the month when there is a new moon? Well, one of the things that we find in Revelation 22 is that God says that he has this tree of life. And on every month, he's going to give them a new fruit from the tree of life. So we would have perpetual life. So we will never get old and never have broken bones and never have gray hair or cataracts or cavities or anything like that. Anyway, I gave you a long answer to a short question. I'm going on to the next person. I see Gray's hand up. Go ahead, Gray. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Um, so my question is actually in regards to um, the curses. Um, you mentioned seven, but I was thinking 10, well, not, well, not 10, but like, I was thinking um, in terms of the Arab slave trade, as well as uh, what the, uh, what we call the chateau slavery or trans transatlantic, but I think it's more called chateau, but. No. What okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so like you mentioned seven, so like wouldn't that be considered like eight and nine or no? Um, if you think about the Arabs, it is nothing more than the Byzantines, right? Because the Byzantines intermarried with the Ishmaelites and the Midianites. You remember Rome divided into two parts. Remember this vision that Daniel has? Mm -hmm. And he sees this statue that it's um, gold on the head. Oh, I got some noise back there. I don't know where it's coming from. We have um, Babylon who has gold on the head. And then you have the Medes and the Persians as silver on the chest. Mm -hmm. and then you have... Um, the grease, which is bronze on the waist, and then you have the legs of iron. You remember that? Mm -hmm. And so these legs of iron is split in two. And that represents Rome divided into two kingdoms. The Western Roman Empire was controlled by Rome in the West, but the Eastern Roman Empire, where Constantine moved the empire to a place called Constantinople. Mm -hmm. uh, it is now called, uh, what was that place me and you went, honey? Istanbul is what it's called now, right? He settled his capital there. Those people intermarry with all of the people from the Far East. And so this, the Muslim religion and all of these different things, they merge. It's still Rome. It's still Rome. Hmm. So, so Daniel was spot on with his prophecy. You and I see it as different, but if you try, follow the lineage of the power, the money, once the Roman Empire dissolved, it went into becoming the Byzantine Empire, which is why we have the Orthodox Greek church, the Orthodox Roman, I mean, Russian church, these are all churches that came out of uh, the Eastern Roman Empire. We have Catholicism, which came out of the Western Roman Empire. And guess what? At the end of the day, they're all still what? Rome. I see. I see. So uh, and is that the concern? Is, is that you're so saying not only Arab, but also the, the Chateau? Is this also considered Rome? That is correct. Rome, Rome owns it all. They own it all. If you ever get a chance, there's a video mm -hmm. that says that um, it's called Rome Created Islam. Rome Created Islam. Mm -hmm. And it's Stop. by a guy named Walter Veith, V-E-I-T. I'm always hearing this man and I'm just like. <laughs> he's, an, he's an incredible man. He's an incredible man. They've been taking down his videos. Some of his videos have millions and millions of views, but they've been pulling them down because he just talks too straight, too uh. straight. So anyway, hopefully I've answered your question. I'm moving on to the next yep. caller. Is that okay? Yep. Thank you so much. All right. And if you guys leave me a few minutes, I'll I'll answer the questions that I think you should have asked. All right. Uh, Sister Kim, go right ahead. Hi there. Hey, how are you doing? Thank you for thank joining you us so today. much for your presentation. My so pleasure. so so we have no connection with Israel. What do you mean no connection? That was our home. So we so we'll never ever go back there. I mean, according to the Bible, we won't. Not before okay. Christ returns. Okay. Many okay. of us don't even know that Israel's in Africa. Why do we want to go there? All they've taught us about Africa is that slavery, and they show you the kid with the the stomach that is um 
swollen from famine and the bugs flying around his face. That's all they want you to see about Africa. They don't want to make it beautiful to you. And there are people on this line who are from Africa, like Chris, he'll tell you. There are places in Africa that are better than our richest palatial places that they have in, in Beverly Hills, but they'll never show you those. They'll never show you those. So they have made, they have made Africa unappetizing to us. Okay, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I see Carla, and then somebody said project complete, and then I'll pivot over to my other questions if there's no one else. All right, Carla, you can unmute. All right, Carla going once. I got All right. you. All right, then. This I'm is, here. I'm here with family, Jeff Andy, right here. He has a question. Is, I'm, I'm hey, here. Jeff. Um, yeah, so I think one of the questions that came up, and I, I didn't, we, we've been just having so many questions here, but one of the questions I wanted to ask was about ham being burnt and or ham meaning burnt. And I know I was reading in, um, or we were mentioning reading in a commentary that Abraham meant like high father, or Abraham meant high father, and then the ham was added. I, we saw some commentary say that was because he was a father of many nations and not just, uh, um, and so is it. Uh, is that just a double meaning? Is it like a double entendre, like where it could mean burnt or where it also means father of many nations? I know you said it was a, that's him means burnt and I think you said uh, uh, Arabic. So yeah, just, just a question. The, of the Bible change. is full of double meanings, Jeff, from Genesis all the way through to the end. It starts off with a story about a woman who was going to have a baby and this woman's baby was gonna be bitten by a snake on his heel. And ultimately this woman's baby was gonna step on the head of the snake and kill him. So those are dealing with multiple, multiple issues. All right, those are dealing with multiple issues. So yes, everything in the Bible is layered. Jesus spoke in, in layered texts. There are sermons inside the sermons. Uh, hopefully I answered your question. You disappeared. I'm trying to meet you. All right. Yeah, yeah, that was good. There was another quick one if I could do a double since there was a short right. one. Hopefully people allow us to do double. Uh, the leprosy one just um, about, I, I know you said, just, just trying to understand the order. Like, so leprosy meant unrighteousness, but is that being like correlating like whiteness to unrighteousness? Or is that just like, uh, like just, is there a text about, if you could bring up the text about the leprosy, and um, yeah, what that's, I guess, trying to say about being leprous and yeah. All right, I'll, I'll run through the rest of these questions and I'll promise to come back and address that, okay? Okay. Right now? All right, so I'm gonna to go to project complete and project complete, I've unmuted you. All right, going once, going once, going twice. Three times, no answer from Project Complete. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I hear you now. Okay, great. I just wanted to know a bit more about the white people since we are the black people. All right. The white, the origin of white people since it was taught, it was the other way around. Can you All expound right. on that? Uh, we're gonna deal with that. Jeff, Jeff brought up some of that information. We, we'll address it and we'll try to walk through it with the text. Everything you, that is important in the world, it is in the Bible. The Bible has left no critical question unanswered. And that's just the truth of the matter. So we'll table that one until we get to the rest of the questions. Is that all right? Yes. All right. Sister Mahalo. Hi. Um, so when you mentioned um, about people eating swine, um, so now I'll put in the chat, what about the verse in the New Testament that says now everything is clean? Hmm. So um, thank you, uh, Elder Thomas. Oh, sorry. Can I um, there's a million texts that, that put that statement in the right context, but let me just see if I can find one, find one text. I think the text that she's referring to, if somebody could give me the text, I think is, is it um, 1 Timothy 4, 4? Ask if somebody could put the text in there where it says that you can eat anything, and then we'll see if we can deal with that quickly. I'm trying to remember the text off the top of my head. I'm just guessing. Let me see here. Is it Timothy? Titus? Uh, it's one of these texts, it's 4-4, four, four. couldn't be Titus because Titus only got three chapters. Uh, all right, 
I'm gonna have to look for it really quick. Somebody says Acts 10. Acts 10 is a different story where he has a dream about a, um, a quilt coming down and it's a dream. And if you read Acts 11, he explains what he meant in Acts 10, saying that, that the Gentiles were unclean, but God tells him to bring the gospel to them. The angel explains what it is. So we won't go into that, but I want to find this text that this, um, hmm, be fun. If, so, if somebody knows the text, I think it's something 4-4, four, 4-4, four. Four, four. where is that text? Let me see. Uh, all right, here it is. First Timothy 4.4. 4. I think this is what your person was um, referring to. So first Timothy 4.3 says, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God had created to be received with thanksgiving, uh, with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. This is Paul talking and explaining to the Greeks what they could and could not eat. And the, the ancient Hebrew Israelites would tell them that they couldn't eat this, they couldn't eat that because they were, they were um, sacrificed to idols. So Paul makes clarity. Yeah, you can, you can eat something sacrificed to an idol. You shouldn't, but you can, right? If you think that it's going to cause somebody else to sin, if they do it knowingly, then don't do it. But are, are these idols real? Are these just demon gods and our God is greater? That's what Paul was saying. So in verse four, he gives, he gives clarification. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. This is the portion that, that most people quote, Sister Mahala. They never go further than this. If it is be received with thanksgiving. And he explains in verse five what he means. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer right? They always say, just pray over it. But he says the word of God. Where in the Bible does it talk about what meat is clean and unclean? That takes us to Leviticus 11, which tells us that we can't eat animals that God calls unclean. That's your pork. That's your shrimp. These are animals that are bottom feeders, crabs, lobsters, shellfish. These are animals that are God's garbage cans. They eat the waste, right? So again, anytime you get these texts, just go a little bit further. The Bible is pretty clear. For it is sanctified by the word of God. Eating a pig is not sanctified by the word of God. You can pray over it all you want. That's why it says word of God and prayer. All right. Sister Lane. Uh, try to unmute again, sis. Okay. I'm going to ask the question. The brother asked one of the questions, but I'm not going to let you leave without this one. If all of those people are um, us, who are we? <laughs> I like the way you phrase oh. it. If they're us, <laughs> who are we? All right, we'll get to that in a minute. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Brother Ed? Hey, how are you, man? Doing well, brother. Talk to me. Hey, three quick questions. Three quick questions. I think I could take that liberty being your big brother. So let all me right. shoot real quick. The first one, first one being, and uh, as we study our lesson, you brought it to our attention that um, recently that Delilah didn't just cut Samson's hair, but she cut seven locks. And it was interesting how you just showed the pictures of the only people who had locks back then. J just sticking with the second one, can you speak to uh, Kush? Are there any pictures that you can pull up of Kush and the great civilization who actually destroyed Egypt at one time? And is, isn't that where Abraham came from? Yes, Abraham was a Kushite before he became a, uh, <laughs> I guess we can't even call Abraham an Israelite because that's a name that goes to his descendants. But yes, he is, he's his family intermarried with the Kushites as well. I don't have any pictures on the ready, Ed, that would just have me sort of looking and uh, time is of the essence. It's already Okay. Done. All right, last question really quick. Can you explain who the niggas of Ethiopia were and their royalty and what that meant? Well, the word negus, N-E-G-U-S, is a word that meant royalty. Uh, that's what the royal class was called. Remember when Solomon, through the Queen of Sheba, you know, the Queen of Sheba goes to Solomon, and she goes to learn from Solomon's wisdom. Um, and one of these ancient books called the Midras, and this is a, a book that tells history of, of, of the Hebrews, it says that Solomon sent her home with a gift, not just gold and silver. He sent her home with a swollen belly, at least a belly that swelled eventually. And it had his, his child. And she also sent her, her home with 
with, um, with priests and with Levites. And, and some people even suggest a copy, if not the original, of the Ten Commandments. Sent her home with that. So this line became the royal line in Ethiopia. The lineage of kings in Ethiopia is longer than any line of kings that can be traced all the way back to Solomon, longer than any nation in the world. And the reason they became kings is because their mother on their mother's side, the Queen of Sheba, was royal. And on their father's side, Solomon was royal. And to identify those people, when they stood in as a king, they called them what? Niggas, right? And that word, again, goes back to what we now call the Hebrew Israelites. Hopefully that was um, covered your question. I see Ray. I see your hand up. I don't know if this is an old hand or a new. Ray, hopefully that's an old hand. It's an old hand, Ray? It's a new hand. A new hand. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, can you explain for our listening audience Psalm 83 by connecting those tribes that are hidden in the Bible? connecting them to who they are today? I can, but I won't do it today. You, I, I'm, I'm going to implore all of you, maybe when I come back, if they ever invite me back again, Brother Ray, we'll spend some time on Psalms 83 and talk about these tribes. But the Bible talks about the tribes who know who you are. These tribes have become nations, and all of them are part of the United Nations, okay? These are the people who rule the world. They have spread out into different nations, but they rule the world. And the Bible suggests that they know who you are, even though you do not. All right? I think that that's a broader answer maybe than what you wanted, but I think we covered it. All right. I'm trying to get to the last of the questions, and then we're going to get to the questions that were tabled. All right. I see Reginald. All right. Reginald going once. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was wondering, so are we saying that the... Um... The, that all, all the Black people, including the ones that were in the East Africa and West Africa, they're all descendants of, uh, of who again? Is, uh, is it Ham or wh 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 which one are we descendants of? And, and um, are we all the same? Are we all from the same descendants? Uh, were you on from the beginning of the presentation? Yeah. All right. So if you were on from the beginning, I told you that Noah had three sons. Japheth, who's descendants yeah. of primarily in Europe. Then there was Ham, whose descendants are primarily in Africa. There is Shem, whose descendants are primarily in Africa. So that would be the general answer to your question. And then I went ahead and I gave you the list of nations that, according to Zondervan, would have been Hamites, Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites. That also lines up with Genesis chapter 10, that names these nations that were descendants of Ham but not the Negroes. So yes, you got two groups of people living side by side. And for all practical purposes, they have intermarried, they look alike. And the only way that I would be able to tell the difference is if they claim a position or not. They have to claim it in order for you to know who they are. And if you go back, I talked about Moses. Remember I told you Moses in Hebrews 11, Moses had to choose what he wanted to be. When I was a kid, I wanted to be an Egyptian. Then I found out better that I was not brought up to do sun worship and that they didn't even come up with science and mathematics and some of the other things that we give them credit for. It says Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So the short answer is brother Reginald, all of us on this line are gonna have to make a choice. Who do we want to be known with? Who do we wanna reckon ourselves with? We know that most of the slaves who were brought over here to America, they took them from a place called Negro land. That's where the children of Israel went from Israel to West Africa, that was the slave coast. So we know who they were targeting, right? The other 10 tribes had already gone into slavery 400 years prior to, to Assyria, right? So they're, they're already spread out. And next year we'll deal with those 10 tribes, but, but here it is. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you, appreciate it. All right, good deal. All right, uh, I see Norma. Ray, I'm gonna put your hand down. I'm assuming that's an old hand. And uh, Norma, you could go right ahead. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So just, I um, have been actually drawn to um, learning who we are and finding out our identity, our identity. So with that drawing, I've just been trying to research. I've been getting on YouTube. So one thing, um, and books, reading books, ordering a lot of books and 
just being in the right place at the right time, such as this. <laughs> and uh, um, one thing I heard is that um, when we were either driven off of our land or driven out, driven out or we fled, whatever the case may be, folks, um, that the Jews that we know as the white Jews right now kind of really stole our identity. They took all of our identity, do not want us to know who we are. And then they took the place. Once we left that land, they actually took the place of us and is using that identity today. Your thoughts? My thoughts is I'm gonna address that next if you're the last question. Okay. Is that fair? All right, yes, I don't see any other hands up. So let's pivot and see if we could deal with Norma's question, which is also a piece of Ed's question, a piece of Jeff Handy's question and some other people. All right, so let's go ahead and I'm gonna move this slide forward. And here's the question that I think Norma was asking. Historical Jews versus modern Jews. Historical Jews versus modern Jews. I don't want to give you my opinion. My opinion does not matter. Can we all agree? Um, Let's see what some scholars have said. These are some scholars. This is a book called The Thirteenth Tribe. It's by a man named Arthur Kessler. Arthur, Arthur Kessler is what is known as an Ashkenazi Jew, um, a Jewish person who came from the area that we now call Turkey, uh, also from uh, the area that is now um, in the middle of a war uh, in Russia. It is, I think. Um, what is the name of the place that we're fighting, that Russia is fighting? What's the name of this place? Um, trying to remember. Ukraine. Ukraine, Ukraine. So the area where the Ukraine is and some of these other places, it was part of a kingdom that was once known as Khazaria, Khazaria. And so this is the same area of land that they are fighting in that these people allegedly came from. So in this book by Arthur Kessler, who claims to be an Ashkenazi Jew, it is called the 13th tribe. He contends, that Ashkenazi Jews are not descended from the historical Israelites of antiquity, but from the Khazars, a Turkish people who converted to Judaism in the eighth century, right? If you're really concerned about it, take a picture of the book, recommend you get it, read it, know it for yourself, fair enough? All right, let me give you a second source, right? This is from the Jewish Encyclopedia, an article by Herman Rosenthal. Herman Rosenthal also uh, associates himself or claims to be an Ashkenazi Jew. And in this article in the Jewish Encyclopedia, this is just like many of us have World Book Encyclopedias in our home. A lot of so-called Jews have the Jewish Encyclopedia. So this is a book that many of them would have, okay? He says, Ashkenazi Khazars adopted Judaism in the eighth century as their religion in 740 AD, okay? I put the link here. You're welcome to type out the link, take a picture of it, go type it out and go read it for yourself. It gives you extreme detail of how these people converted, at least according to the article, all right? I'm gonna go on to another book. This book is by Shlomo Sam. This book has been on the Times bestseller list probably longer than most books. <laughs> right? It's been on there forever and ever. I don't know if it's still on there today, but for years, it was on the Times bestseller list. It is called The Invention of the Jewish People, The Invention of the Jewish People by Shlomo Sand. He claims to be a Sephardic, Sephardic Jew, I believe, a Sephardic Jew. And he is a professor of history at the Tel Aviv University. And he is a professor emeritus, which means that it's very difficult for the university to fire him unless he does something super egregious. And so this book was um, printed with the, with the university's permission. Um, and it, it, in his book, it says that most modern Jews actually descended from converts whose native lands were scattered from across the Middle East and Eastern Europe. Now, when you see this term Middle East based on today's study, every time you hear the word Middle East, the first word that should pop in your mind is Africa, Northeast Africa. Every time you see Middle East, I want you to say oh, Northeast Africa right? Because that's what the Middle East is. And it says he contends that there is no historical record of modern European Jews ever migrating out of Israel in the past because of Roman exile. They don't fit the prophecy that Jesus talks about in Matthew 24. So this is Shlomo saying the invention of the Jewish people. 
take a picture of the book, go order it on Amazon or wherever else, and hopefully it will give you some clarity, okay? I see somebody named Circa has their hand up. I'll see what the question is, Circa. And then we, we'll do it one more issue, then we'll land the plane. Um, I, I muted you, Circa, go on once. I give thanks, um, all of us having this, the Holy Spirit works in a lot of different ways. And this is, I think, very key for the last day gospel. But um, my my family roots are from Sinkitz Nevis in the East Caribbean islands. And um, this type of information that we're discussing, I, I was just wondering, um, were the, I worked in a, Jew, I worked in a Jewish, a wine store in the basement of a synagogue in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Um, and I, I, I was, I had started some research in regards to this. It's been coming a long time. And um, I'm, I'm under the impression that they were the, those, the Jews, quote unquote, were involved in the, the trans, the trans slave trade um of us from that aspect and i'm wondering is that would that be uh mathematically correct um i i don't know if that's a clear i don't know what you mean mathematically correct or historically accurate uh, there there are historical sources that would support your position i'll leave it at that is that fair that's crystal all right let me go forward we had some other questions here and I wanna to talk to you about leprosy now. I'm gonna to talk to you about leprosy. And then after that, we'll land the plane. It's 217 and I've consumed most of your day, most of your day. So leprosy, uh, deception. What people call leprosy nowadays um, is called Hansen disease. Hansen's disease is what is modern day leprosy. It's called leprosy. Like in the movies, when they say somebody has leprosy, they're referring to Hansen's disease. There was a, a movie called, what was this movie with, um, oh man, who was the guy who put together that movie? Mel Gibson, Mel Gibson. The name of the movie was called Braveheart. I don't know if anybody ever saw the movie called Braveheart. And it was about the, some people who take over Scotland with a guy named William Wallace and the father walks around and he has this, a wrap over his face and he has a disease on his face, right? That disease that he has is called, um, it was called uh, Hansen's disease. They now call Hansen's disease leprosy, okay? So in 1873, a Norwegian doctor by the name of Gerhard Henrik Amar Hansen discovered a germ which caused skin lesions and nerve damage. And this is what it would do to people's faces and other parts of their bodies. Hansen's disease was later renamed leprosy. It mainly affects the skin, the eyes, the nose, and peripheral nerves. Symptoms include light colored or red skin patches with reduced sensation, numbness, and weakness in the hands and feet. Leprosy can be cured with six to 12 months of multi-drug therapy, all right? So this is the disease that was renamed in modern times as leprosy. Everybody with me so far, okay? Let's go look at the Bible and see what the Bible calls leprosy. In Exodus chapter four, verse six, it says, and the Lord said furthermore unto him, put now thy hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. Who is this guy that the Bible is talking about? This is Moses. Moses is talking to a bush. The bush is telling him, go rescue the Israelites. And Moses is like, I need proof that you're God. So the bush says, put your hand in. Now, this is important because in that movie that we talked about at the beginning of the study, that movie called The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston and um, Yule Brenner and, and the other guy was in it. They never show this in the movie. I mean, they show the, the two snakes, the two sticks going down and turning into snakes. They never show Moses putting his hand in. Because in that movie, Moses would have put in a hand that was white and would have pulled out a hand that was what? White, no change. In Exodus 4, 7, and it says, and he said, put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it turned again as his other flesh. So if he puts it in and it becomes white, 
And he pulls it out and he's terrified. And the Bible says, put it back in and I'm going to turn it as your other flesh. What color must Moses' other flesh have been? Well, we already know, according to Exodus 2, 9, that when the girl saw him, she thought he was a what? An Egyptian. So he was brown. We know the Egyptians were brown because they painted pictures of themselves all over Egypt and everywhere else. Okay? So Exodus 4, 6 gives you a breakdown. This is what happened to Moses' hands. God tells you where everything comes from. He's very clear. Just got to look in the Bible. Um, we're going to talk about Miriam. It says in Numbers 12, 10, it says, And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow, and Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. Right? And the Bible says white as snow. They've always tried to make us think that our, colors, our color was a curse on us. That was the trick. That's why you got people now still buying whitening agents. You know, a lot of people from African countries, the Caribbean, the Philippines, and even some of y'all, man, trying to, you trying to scrape off the stuff that made you look like Adam, right? Who looked like God. You trying to scrape it off. You trying to perm your hair and straighten it out because they, they taught us that if my skin was lighter and my hair was straighter, I would be more like this God image that they created. In Leviticus chapter 13, verse 30, Leviticus 13, verse 30, it says, then the priest shall see the plague and behold, if it be in sight deeper than the skin and there be in it a yellow thin hair, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a dry skull, even a leprosy upon the head or beard. So what is this yellow thin hair? What do we call it now? Anybody know? We call it blonde. We call it blonde hair, right? Yellow, thin hair, right? And this is what we find sometimes with people. Another thing that comes about with leprosy or albinism or any of those things, it changes the color of your eyes, right? So these are the things we are, we try to imitate what the Bible says is something that, that shows God's, uh, God's finger on it. It was called the finger of his wrath when God was, was mad at somebody. This is what he would do. He would snatch away their melanin, right? It was called the stroke of God. Strike that, the stroke of God. So in Numbers 12, we find Miriam struck with leprosy. This is Numbers 12, verse 10. And it says, and when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous as white as snow. Then Aaron turned towards Miriam and there she was, a leper. This is Miriam before the leprosy. This is Miriam after the leprosy, right? Verse 11, Numbers 12, 11. And Aaron said to Moses, O my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Verse 12, please do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So this is Aaron. He's pleading for his sister who has now been cursed with leprosy. And he says, don't let her be like one who was dead, half consumed, coming out of his mother's womb. Reason being, the baby in the womb, I don't care how black your parents are, that baby is going to be a, a color with no melanin until just about the ninth week. It takes nine weeks of this baby being inside the mother to, for its melanin to begin to appear, right? And so this same baby might be born this color, and after six months, this is what the baby looks like. And for many of you, if you look at your baby pictures when you're first born and look at yourself now, you even questioning if that's you, right? And so what are you saying if, if a baby is born stillborn, they may be born earlier than this, this process was able to complete itself. And that's why he says, please do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when it comes out of his mother's womb, right? Or an aborted baby or a miscarriage baby, depending on when those things happen, that nine-week period when the melanin starts to kick in may not have appeared, and, and Aaron was terrified about that prospect of what his sister looked like. Verse 13, so Moses cried out to the Lord, please heal her, O God, I pray. Right? And the Bible says, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow, and Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. So what did they do to people who had leprosy in the Bible? Right? In Numbers 15, it says, so Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days. And the people did not journey till Miriam was brought in again, right? So for some portion in the Bible, we find that leprosy was a curse that God put on people. It was a snatching away of their melanin, all right? Um, in the Bible, in 2 Samuel 3, verse 29, 
this is a curse that Saul, I mean, sorry, that David wants to put on the family of Joab. He's asking God to punish him. And he says, may it fall on the head of Joab and on all of his father's house. And may there not fail from the house of Joab, one who has a discharge, who is a leper or takes hold of a distaff or who falls by the sword or who lacks bread. These are the things because Joab is his, his head general under David, but Joab doesn't listen to David. He does his own thing. So, so David is asking on his a dying bed that God put a curse on Joab and his descendants, right? And one of those things that he asked for is leprosy. Now, when God gave people leprosy, it was recessive, right? It wasn't that if the father had leprosy that the child would have leprosy, would not automatically pass from father to child. We find an exception to that rule in the book of 2 Kings chapter 5. This is the exception. There was a man named Naaman. You remember Naaman in the Bible? And uh, Naaman comes because he tries to get healed from leprosy. And it says Naaman the leper went down into the Jordan seven times and he came up shouting, right? His, his skin changed and at, on the seventh dip. So in 2 Kings 5.1, it says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a what? a leper, right? And if you read the full story, and I recommend that you do, God heals him of his leprosy, but Elisha's servant goes after Naaman and asks him for, for gold and for silver and, and rich apparel, clothes. The prophet in, in 2 Kings 5, Elisha finds out about it because God tells him, and he says, the leprosy that was on Naaman shall now cling unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence, a leper as white as snow. So this is the only place where we find this in the Bible, when leprosy becomes a, a punishment by God, and now it will cling to the, the remainders of, of um, Gehazi's family forever, forever. Right, so it's no longer a recessive gene, it is now a dominant gene. It is no longer necessarily a curse on the rest of, of Gehazi's family because they didn't do anything wrong. But God says, because of what your great, great, great grandfather did, I snatched your melody, I snatched it. And that's where we find this in the Bible, all right? So this is where we find these chains of colors, these people intermarry, and you will find like a lot of nations intermarry the, the Greeks under um, Alexander the Great intentionally took women of color um, and, and slept with them with hopes of turning them to look like Alexander. But the reverse happened. We just got shades of brown, right? Same thing happened uh, with Napoleon, with his armies, the Caesars and their armies. Everybody tried to destroy us by sleeping with our women and all they produced was more of us. All they produced was more of us. All right, I see Gray. I have some other things. I'll leave it for another day. We had 2.30, and um, I don't want to wear out the patience of the saints. Maybe, hopefully, we'll get invited back one day. All right, Sister Gray, I've unmuted you, or Brother Gray. Yeah, it's um, uh, yeah, just a quick question. So I know in some parts of um, certain parts of um, Africa where um, if someone does have um, like albinoism or um, leprosy, um, they will sometimes, um, I mean, I'm not sure if you don't know about this, it's fine. Um, but they'll sometimes cut off certain limbs, um, and use it for witchcraft. And I wasn't sure if that has anything to do with, um, like what you were talking about. I'm not familiar with that, but thank you for raising the question. I'll put it in my check it out later file. <laughs> well, <laughs> All right. So, um, if there's nothing else, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to mute you back. And let's take a look here. These are some texts that I wanted to share on the way out. Because the logical question is somebody's got to ask, why does this matter? Why does all of this matter? Does, are we all gonna be saved? Everybody can accept Christ. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because there are still prophecies in the Bible that have things to do with these literal descendants of Abraham, not just the spiritual descendants that the Bible allows in, in Romans chapter 11. Those are the Gentiles who the Bible says is grafted in, 
right? But he also says that he's going to save a remnant of us. We don't get saved because of our color or because we're descendants of Abraham. We don't get a pass because of that. We're still responsible for keeping his laws, statutes, and commandments and having faith and claiming Christ as our savior. I just want to make that clear to everybody because these Hebrews that God cursed and many of them won't make it into the kingdom. They knew his name. They knew how to say it. They knew what it looked like. They know what his hair was like. They knew his language. They knew where he was from. And they were still lost. They still didn't accept him as their savior. They said his blood be upon us and our children crucify him. Let's look at some text that may give you some idea why some of this may still be relevant. It says in 1 Samuel 12, 22, for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it had pleased the Lord to make you his people. Right? God chose these people under um, Jacob, his 12 sons, and they were responsible for giving the, the gospel. They were called to be the evangelists of the world. So they had great responsibility. To whom much is given, much is required. That's, that's the main takeaway that you need to have from this study. God had given us special privilege. He had given us resources. He had given us a land. And with all of the more he gave us, the more wicked we became. And so every time we became wicked and strayed too far away from him, he put us back in slavery. We would repent and come back, right? In 2 Kings 23, 27, and the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight as I have removed Israel. And I will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen and the house, which I said, my name shall be there. So he says, when I'm going to remove Israel, he's talking about the Northern 10 tribes, the ones that went under Jeroboam, right? And then the other tribes were under Rehoboam, right? And that was Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And under him was Judah and Benjamin. Benjamin stayed loyal to Judah. Psalm 77, 7 says, will the Lord cast off forever and will he be favorable no more? Psalms 89, 31, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, um, verse 32, then will I visit their transgression with a rod and their iniquity with stripes. What is the rod that Christ uses? Remember, he says that Christ is going to come with a rod of iron. Anybody ever remember reading that in the Bible? That's one of his, his main tools, a rod of iron. What is the rod of iron? It is Rome. He uses the Roman kingdom, the iron kingdom. Remember, the head of gold was Babylon. The chest of silver was the Medes and the Persian. The waist was the, um, the Greeks. And then the legs were iron. So God uses the Roman Empire and he uses the popes to break down his own people. And later on, he will come and destroy them. He will destroy the ones that he sent to destroy his people. And that's what that rod is in the hand of Christ. He used them for his own purpose, right? Yeah, they did a lot of wicked things, but he used them to subject these other nations. And if it were not for Rome, the gospel would not have traveled around the world. Yes, they gave an apostate gospel, but it wasn't always apostate. At the beginning, Rome's gospel was pure, but the longer it lasted, the more people became greedy and they wanted to use the gospel as a tool for their own material gain. All right, we got a few more texts. Psalms 89, 33 says, nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Psalms 89, 34, my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. 89, 35, once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. 36, his seed shall endure forever in his throne as the sun before me. Yes, he's speaking of Christ, but he's also speaking about the literal descendants of Abraham under Jacob's family would still be around. And I know we teach sometimes as a church that it's only spiritual Israel that's around. No, it's not just spiritual Israel. You have physical Israel that is still around. And yes, they have to accept the same things that the, the Gentiles who are converted have to accept. They still have to accept Christ. They still have to accept the commandments. They still have to be faithful. They still have to call on Christ as their savior. They, those things are still required for the remnant of them that make it in. But there were some prophecies in the Bible that still deal with these people. And the main one being uh, Ezekiel 37. When you get a chance, go read Ezekiel 37. The question was, can these dry bones put flesh back on them? Can anybody wake up this sleeping lion? And the Bible assures us that before Christ returns, that many of us will wake up and remember who we were. That's what that movie, The Lion King, was all about. It was about you. You were a king there in Africa, in Israel, 
and they take you away and put you in a foreign place and you're just singing la 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 la, whatever that song he was singing, akuna matata, like nothing matters. Our history don't matter, right? All of these things don't matter. And then all of a sudden we get a clunk in the head. Somebody clunks us in the head and we recognize how important it was. When we remember that we are children literally of this, um, of Jacob, we have to remember God's law, statutes, and commandments. And the first thing that most people do when they wake up and find that they're Hebrew Israelites is they start keeping Sabbath. That's it. That's like the number one thing. I mean, it's automatically a chain gets broken. And then they put a, they put down pork. Then they start reading the Bible. Most churches, they don't read the Bible. You get a sermon for, for hours and hours, and you may get a scripture or two. But these things change, and the Bible becomes precious to you. Precious. Because it's a history book. Psalms 89, 37, it shall be established forever as the moon, as a faithful witness in heaven. This is Paul speaking in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty two. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. There it is. Just like a person tells you they're from Ireland, they say I'm Irish American. I'm Spanish American. I'm this American. The fact that they're Irish doesn't change whether or not they, they're Catholic or Protestant. They're still Irish, right? Or being Irish won't change the fact whether they believe how the earth is shaped. All kinds of things won't change because they're Irish, but at least they know they're Irish. We are Hebrew Israelites. And, and, and for some of us, it will make some changes. Some of us will keep Sabbath. Some of us won't keep Sabbath. There's a lot of things that we won't do, but once you realize who you are, you start to open this book up again and hopefully start to listen to what God is saying, right? So it's not a religion. Hebrew Israelite is not a religion. It's a nation. It's a nation that has been separated. It's not a religion. It is a nation. All right. With that being said, I'm done, everyone. I do thank you for your time and attention. I appreciate being on here. Um, I guess whenever I get the video back from the church, we'll post it some way. Uh, if you want more information, I invite you to get on our Bible study. We do a Bible study two days a week. It's called Cover to Cover. And we go through the Bible literally one chapter at a time. We are on, we just finished Numbers 24 this morning. We have doing this Bible study for the last year now. We're on Numbers 24. I invite you to come on. And we asked um, 30,000 people to take the Cover to Cover challenge to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation for yourself. So if you want the free link for the um, one-year Bible reading guide, just text me, 202-409-4456. Text C to C, which is cover to cover. We don't charge anything. I'm not trying to get any money. I ain't even trying to track you. I didn't, nothing. I just want you to read the Bible. So if you're interested in getting the free guide, just text me, or you're welcome to join us every Wednesday at 6 a.m. or every Sabbath at 6 a.m. We do it live, but it's also on YouTube. And I'll give you the YouTube playlist and you and your family can go through the Bible one chapter at a time. I ended up doing this because of my doctor who's on the line, Dr. Kim. She said to me, if you go through the Bible one chapter at a time, I'll go with you. And she's been here ever since. So Dr. Kim, I thank you. All of these things really started with your request. So I am grateful beyond words. So I invite you to take the challenge of cover to cover, whether you do it with me or do it on your own or do it with a community of hope definitely read the Bible cover to cover. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to the pastor. I don't know if he wants to give any final words. I do want to just thank him again from the bottom of my heart. I'm grateful that he has opened up his digital pulpit and allowed me to share some information with you. And I pray that somebody has gained something that will help them have a better and stronger walk with Christ and ultimately to be saved. Hey, pastor. Man. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Elder. Like you said, uh, you know, they say knowledge is power, but like you said, when you know better, you got to do better. And so thank you for providing knowledge that allows us to know better so that we can indeed do better. Uh, the encouragement is and the impact of what your words have been uh, a show up. Mahala Dar, one of our a longtime members that has spoken so uh, encouragingly and passionately about the time she spends with you in the cover to cover of the Bible study as well and how it's made an impact on her life. So I just second your ministry uh, and ask people to engage in learning for themselves and going through the word of God. Uh, we wish you all a happy Sabbath and pray that you have a great and blessed week. Uh, and yes, indeed. I said it in the chat, but you didn't, you, you missed it. I said, you come back next week, but uh, <laughs> you're on the wait till next year, but we, we look forward to having you again. Obviously, this is a rich topic 
uh, that's difficult to cover. Well, no, impossible to cover uh, in, in one Sabbath, especially a service, but we look forward to digging in more and deeply with you. Thank you. Thank you so much again. And thank you, Sister Larie, for the invitation as well. So with that being said, I look forward to seeing each of you at the gates.